Hello, I'm Janice from the Singapore Art Museum, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's session, Art Worlds, a conversation with Chomwan Wiwawarawi. This program is organized by the Singapore Art Museum and is part of our exhibition, Koakri Arunanontai, a machine boosting energy into the universe, which is currently showing at our new space at Tanjo Paga District Park. This evening, I'm very pleased to introduce you to our speaker, curator at the Bangkok Art Biennale 2022, Chomwan Wirawari. And moderating the session this evening, we have curator at Singapore Art Museum, Kenji. Thank you for joining us, over to you. Thank you so much, Janice. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening or morning, wherever you are. And we're very happy today to be welcoming Chomwan to be here with us, even if virtually for now. Um, and while Chung Wan kind of sets up for her talk, I'll give maybe a brief introduction to, to kind of the context for this talk, which is, as Janice mentioned, uh, Corporate Arun Nun Chai's solo show at Singapore Art Museum, which is on until the 3rd of May. So if you're in Singapore, please do check it out. And the conversations that we've had with Corporate in developing the show, you know, has really shown him to be an artist who really moves fluidly across these realms of art, music, fashion, filmmakers, and quite a dizzying array of people who he has collaborated with and has worked with. But in, in these conversations, I think many of these roads lead back to Chongwan. And so, of course, I think it's with great pleasure to also be speaking with Chongwan, who I think embodies the same kind of multi-hyphenate, multi multidisciplinary practice of having worked over the past 16 years with a very diverse array of creative practitioners. Uh, Chongwan is trained in law and holds a PhD from King's College London in intellectual property and fashion. And in, in one of her many lives, she was responsible for putting together the intellectual property strategy for one of the biggest TV networks in Thailand. But of course, Chongwan is also known for her work in the art world having founded uh, Mysterious Ordinary, which is a creative studio and consultancy that has worked on many projects, including Film on the Rocks in 2012, uh, a program that was co-curated by Apishat Pong, Weir Setakun, and Tilda Swinton. And she's also worked with prominent artists like Rupert Tria Vanit and, and Korkrit for um, projects, including the Land Foundation and Ghost. And of course, another hat that Chongwen wears is in the fashion world, uh, working as the creative director of Philip Huang. And most recently, she is on the curatorial team of the upcoming Bangkok Art Biennial later this year. So I will stop with this list because this list can go on forever and hand it over to Chong Wan to, to really maybe kick us off and take us through some of the work that you've done. And then we'll, we'll jump into a conversation later on uh, to unpack that further. And uh, for those of you watching, if you have any questions, please put that in the Q&A. Uh, we'll accumulate questions all along and we'll circle back to them. Over to you, Chung Wen. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much, um, Singapore Art Museum, Kenji, for having me. Uh, this is probably the first time I'm actually talking about my practice because I don't think I ever saw it as a practice. And I think the introduction you gave, I could not have given one, which is better because the question that's usually asked to me is like, what do you do? Right. So it's never been something that I could answer. So, you know, thanks very much for this opportunity to clarify a bit, and um, especially in the context of Cora Crit's show in Singapore, because I think this is, I mean, the work that you guys are showing is, is amazing. And I, yeah, so Crit is someone I work really closely with, and please allow me to share my screen. So I shall be, um, I guess, going through sharing what I do. So instead of going like, for, how do you say, like forwards, I'll sort of be going backwards. And I think what I realized in this whole process of preparing this presentation and, you know, my conversations with Kenji is that maybe a lot of what I do is kind of non-linear and it sort of works like that, but maybe there's a sort of through line somewhere. So, um, you know, as Kenji had mentioned, you can see my screen, right? Um, Mysterious Ordinary is a sort of studio consultancy I founded in 2010 after uh, my time at the Mass Communication Organization of Thailand. And it was something which 
in a way enabled me to work with artists, work with designers, work as a vehicle of sorts. But I think that sounds a little bit abstract. So we'll just kind of go through, I think, and through the projects themselves, you'll sort of be able to see the approach perhaps. Um, and probably what's what would make, make the most sense is starting with the BAB. So I am on the curatorial team of the upcoming Bangkok Art Biennale. Um, when Ajan Apinan, um, Dr. Apinan asked me, you know, would you like to be on the curatorial team? I basically said, are you sure? Like, what am I supposed to do? What does a curator do? Like, are you sure? Like, I'm not in the art world. You know, and he said, you know what? Just do what you do. And I said, okay, so I'll run with that. The theme of um, the Bangkok Art Biennale this year is chaos calm. And you'll sort of see, you know, sort of thinking to myself, how do I fit in here? And you'll see that there's kind of like a gray line in between these two kind of nodes of chaos calm. And I think this probably in a way enabled me to really look back at the work that I've done and kind of the approaches that I'm interested in and quote unquote, my practice. Um, and I think where I've always stood and where I feel quite comfortable is in this gay, gray area. So, you know, when you say chaos, calm, that, that sort of silence in between that doesn't necessarily have a title, but perhaps enables a lot of different things to come together. So that's kind of like, we haven't announced our artist list yet, but that will be coming quite soon. And, um, and just, I'm really grateful for this opportunity because I think where, what I'm interested in is the space in between that allows for alternative interpretations of a lot of things, or if we're set in believing that things have to go one way because you've been trained in one way, maybe there's an opportunity to either question that or offer an alternative, right? So what I've been working on, the kind of the latest project, I suppose, and one which is really meaningful for me was um, the Thailand premiere of Memoria. So this is a film which won the Prix de Jury at Cannes by Abhishad Pong Wirse Tukun and, you know, starring Tilda Swinton. Um, till then, Pitoi, so I call him Pitoi, right, Joe. So they met a while back, you know, and I think the, the first real encounter was perhaps also on an island in Thailand 10 years ago. And that was this film festival that they co-curated together that I co-founded. But what's so amazing about Memoria is that it wasn't made in Thailand. It was made in Colombia. And um, the brief that I received from Peter, I, you know, we, I, because of the whole Thailand pass, whatever was sandbox situation last year, I couldn't make it back to Thailand in time. Like, when I was supposed to and ended up being able to stay for the American premiere of the film in New York in October, we had a chance to kind of chat. And he said, you know, it'd be really great if Tilda Swinton could make it. It would be really great for Tilda to be in Thailand for the premiere. And he said, you know, can we work on that? And I said, okay, like, let's work on that. And, you know, seeing the film and kind of working on this project together with uh, PB, Katlia Pausi Jaron of 185 Film, films made me realize, you know, I mean, I realized this before having worked with these guys over the last 10 years is that, you know, to make a film, to premiere a film, it takes, it takes more than a village and it takes just so much collaboration and also like just patience. And also I think in the context of Thailand where there's not necessarily seed funding for a lot of this stuff, there's no grants, there's no funds. It requires a little bit of um, maybe creativity and looking to partners that you don't necessarily like um, would think of. And I think in this case, we found a really phenomenal partner in the House of Chanel, um, of which Tilda is an ambassador of, and they were our partner in the uh, Thailand premiere of the film. And so you see here a picture of all of us on the beach, and you know, that was because we did all of this during COVID. I mean, this was when Thailand was still supposed to have a seven day sandbox. And so we'd planned everyone's trip, you know, to stop in Phuket. And I think why it was so important to have everyone there is because it's like family. And I think I am so grateful to have been kind of somehow included in this family that spans across the globe, but really like the Colombian family. Um, and Diana Bustamante to be able to see, you know, Simon Field again. So this was um, 
some pictures from the Chanel dinner in Phuket that celebrated Memoria, you know, in Thailand. And, you know, this was the Thailand premiere of the film, which again, you know, ATK, 388 people, no one tested positive that night. I'm not quite sure, you know, it was on top, it's already, it was such an, a phenomenal experience because on top of getting everyone here, on top of releasing a film, which, you know, all, all due respect to PB and her film, I mean, it was so much bigger than we thought it would be. And rightly so, you know, this was like in a way a homecoming. Abhishad Pongwir said to Kun Pichai had won the Palme d'Or in 2010, 12 years ago. You know, I mean, he's, I think he's won six awards at 10 in total, right? Four, is it four or six? It's, you know, multiple, but this really felt like a homecoming in some way and to have everyone here. I mean, this, this really showed, I think in a way being involved in this was how it can be so much greater going back to the cinema, what cinema means. I mean, if you guys have had a chance to see the film, it's like a truly immersive experience. And, you know, this idea of being able to take to be taken on a journey, I think, you know, so my involvement here and when everyone asks, like, how are you involved in Memoria? I always say like, I'm kind of the special projects person. So my friend and also long-term collaborator, Lynn, Wisata, Lynn Wisota Rome, like we kind of, you know, stepped in as special projects people and, you know, everyone else is already super packed, right? Like it's distribution of a film. It's about, it's, there's a whole mechanic to that that goes beyond, you know, what I've ever really fully understood, but what has always been important for me, and I think where I step in is, you know, how do we create an experience for everyone to come together? So I think that's it, right? When you go back to the cinema, you know, you find a way to be together, even though um, there's COVID, so there's ATK tests galore, but we still managed to be together. There was a gala night, after the premiere, this was at the newly minted Jim Thompson Art Center, you know, our wonderful host. And I'm what I'm showing right here, I suppose, is the stuff that no one sees, but very much part of what I do. So I think it's really important to have these like touch points to be able to add to the memory, you know, so even though the culture, the art, the film, the music, it's already so powerful, but it would be pretty Russian if you saw an amazing film and you were invited to a gala dinner and you weren't served very good food, right? Or you go to a wonderful talk, but you're like kind of starving and there's no coffee. So I think a lot of the background work that I do with my team is like, we create that experience. And I think we're really lucky to, um, have some really good friends and partners to be able to do this. So at another level, apart from special projects, it becomes like the partnerships manager, right? So Chanel is this, a really, really big kind of partner, but you know, along the way there's, you know, the guys who do the food. So like the first night it was 100 Mahase. During, we did two days of masterclasses at the Thai Film Archive. So another partner of, you know, Memoria. And um, you sort of see this picture, you've got like, the food, you've got the drinks, you've got the experience. I kind of wanted to add this because a lot of people asked me what the dog was and who the dog was. And I know that a lot of people who saw the film kept saying like, the dog isn't in there. Like, what's that dog? And so the dog is this little dog that it's a picture that Tilda took. And it's a dog that was always kind of there. And this was the night that they managed to get the dog to kind of hang out with them. And so if Memoria is also a film that's about memory and collective memory, I think for me, it's having these like, again, touch points. And so this was the um, masterclass with Tilda Swinton, which was um, uh, presented or in partnership with Chanel and Thai Film Archive. So it was like pretty amazing to see her speak about her practice, you know, cause we see her very much as like uh, an actress, but Tilda is in a way so much more. And what I realize in is, is in what I do, I think what I'm drawn to are people who do, you know, it's never a singular track, right? Like Abhishad Pong obviously is a filmmaker, but he's also an artist. He's also like a photographer. He's also a writer. There's so many things that kind of, you know, there's this whole world, right? So this is a super packed, it was really packed uh, masterclass with Tilda Swinton and the partnership with Chanel also Chanel also enables us to have a couple more masterclasses and you know here's Deanna with Raymond 
Diana is the Colombian producer of the film and there was a masterclass with Abhishad Pong himself with Sompot and um, a documentary filmmaker. Uh, yeah, and you know, I wanted to include this because I, going back to the whole fundraising thing, right? Because unlike Singapore or a lot of people, like countries in the West where there's funds, there's grants, it doesn't really work like that here in Thailand. And, you know, for me, I think we could, I could sit around and maybe be bitter about it. And, you know, that's like one approach or the other approach is, is to find other ways, right? And um, I think it's like finding partners, like-minded partners, and also being able to offer like, kind of bring people into a circle of support, you know, of care and of support. And that's something that we did with Memoria. We created Friends of Memoria and, you know, Kitai made a beautiful diptych of um, pictures that he took from the set. And thank you very much the supporters. We, this, this really helped to kind of create in a way a distributors fund because Common Move is a distributor of uh, Memoria and it's really worth kind of emphasizing what Common Move is. Again, founded by PB Hatlia. People sort of maybe sometimes take for granted, right? Like the mechanics of how things work and how people can kind of see things. But I think a lot of that, like the behind the scenes, like requires a lot, you know, for things to be able to be communicated, to be able to be presented. And I think, again, where I step in is um, perhaps as a lawyer by training, you know, I think it's a lot about language and it's a lot about making your case, maybe sometimes winning your case and being able to propose an alternative to what exists. So um, I don't know, a lot of people kind of maybe notice that Pizza wears a lot of blue and, you know, it's because with Philip Huang, the label, that I founded with my husband, Philip. Um, we started in Isan and it's this blue from indigo from the province, the Sukunakan province in Isan. And I remember on our first, I don't know, go here first, our first road trip to Isan, I remember texting Pita right away and saying like, oh my gosh, I think I just stepped into to your film. Like I just, I feel like I have been transported into one of your films like I think it was specifically Tropical Malady but um, you know so what we ended up doing with Memoria is creating a sort of limited edition I'd say it's more like a conversation than it is like merch right so you'll see here the storyboards his storyboards interpreted my our assistant creative director Duke who really worked with Pijo's sort of drawings and you know in a way the lines of the tie-dye itself to create something which for us, I think captures memoria. And if you've seen the film, you'll see why it's silver as well, because there's something metallic about it. But, you know, so this is sort of like the world which has really occupied my time for the last couple of years. And it's this world of Philip Huang, which is our family business, and which really in a way, that's Philip right there, that really in a way encapsulates what I did, like my practice as a lawyer. So my, many people asked, you know, when um, the BAB push up Dr. Chomwan, they said, really, you have a doctorate, what's it in? I said, well, it's in law, but probably quite specific. Uh, my thesis was intellectual property and the textiles industry in developing countries. And what I was interested in was how and is how IP could be used as a tool, particularly for artisans and craftsmen. So people who still do things with their hands, right? So traditional knowledge and this idea of like, knowledge passed on through generations and also Tiahua. like what we do you know is we work with multiple villages in the province of Sikonakan which is registered indigo as a geograph geographical indication but through the last five six years of working there we realized that you know it's not just indigo it's it's mud it's tree bark it's like tree mites it's berries it's mangoes there's this phenomenally rich treasure box of knowledge which exists outside of the city and you know in a place you know in, in Thailand right like maybe sometimes we take for granted a little bit how much we have like how much we truly have and this really was perhaps a way for me to also understand where I come from but also you know it's like a thesis but we're really grateful that it works 
you know, as like a label, but also maybe in a way as like a vehicle. Um, what we did as COVID was beginning was we relaunched our business and we made a film. So it was suggested to us um, by our PRs at the time uh, that we make a film and it be a documentary and it's about indigo and the land. And I thought, oh, everyone must know what indigo is. You know, it's like a natural dye made from plants. And someone said to me, well, actually they don't know. And we thought, okay, so we'll do this. And um, I called up, I think I called up PB again. So it's always PB called up PB. And I said, you know, I really, we need to make this documentary. I don't know how to make one. Like I've seen you guys do it. So can you help me? And she did. So I think in two weeks, again, I think, I think it was like the window two weeks after Thailand had lifted their kind of um, moving out of provinces, traveling into provinces. Uh, so we did this also literally like we worked with a crew that this was the first time they went on set since COVID started. I was really, really lucky that Pisong Siyompu Mukti Prom was not traveling and wanted to do this with us. So Pisong is a cinematographer of, you know, of memoria of Uncle Bunmi, who can recall his past lives, of Call Me By Your Name, of Suspiria. And, you know, in a way, as much as Philip and I think we've spent a lot of time in Isan, I mean, Pisong has studied the clouds, studied this, you know. So it was really, it was like an amazing experience, which, you know, it was this 12 minute visual essay, which I ended up direct, directing because um, I didn't really have a budget to hire a director. And our post-production supervisor, Lee Chatamitikun said, well, you kind of, I think they had a conversation. He said to PB, well, Chom kind of has to do it. So it's like, you know, find us, like that's, that's what we did. So, you know, these are some stills from the film, but I think it was really like, it was something that, like I said, we maybe we took for granted, but it enabled us to tell the stories of the artisans, of our indigo grandmas. I mean, they're all women. And um, I mean, it's interestingly enough, during COVID, we relaunched with socks. And I guess it being socks and sweatpants and stuff, I think there's more guys now involved, you know, helping their grandmas. And I think the crux of what my thesis was about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, was how can IP, intellectual property, really be used by the people who are supposed to be using it and what does it even mean? And for me, what it means is being able to communicate what it is, right? So we could call it marketing, we can call it branding, but I think it's effective storytelling. So it's a conversation I also had with Pisong. He's like, you know, there's a lot to do. There's still a lot to do to be able to make sure that the knowledge is passed on, that it stays alive, that it stays relevant. And I think, you know, some one thing that Philip and I keep in mind all the time is one of the artisans we work with, worked with, still work with, she's really busy. She said, you know, it's not about buying what we have and putting it in, in a museum. It's about using it. It's about letting it live. And I think that's something that informs what we do. And I guess because of that, we see ourselves more as a vehicle in a way, rather than like making product. Like we, we in a way create a bridge, we create a conversation. One day, maybe we can like commission more things, but you know, as a vehicle and, you know, facilitating collaborations, I think for a lot of artists, for shows, for things that we have today, it's nice to be able to go back with a souvenir, you know, so these are some of the t-shirts that we've done over the last four or five years, whether it be with Pirac Rit, that was for the Land Foundation, fundraiser in Hong Kong, Korakrit's shirt for his show in Thailand in 2016, the Ghost merch shirt, there's uh, some work that we did with Rick Ritt and Anto. Love Conquers All is a mosque and a t-shirt that we did with Wars Alawalia. It was supposed to always be a t-shirt, but at the height of COVID, we also made these mosques. And that's what Love Conquers All is. We made the merchandise, the merch shirts for Memoria, which Common Move are selling. And what you see on the right is a collaboration, an ongoing conversation we have with Echo Leather to create in a way, um, I don't want to call it sustainable, but it's it's really the lowest impact leather that you could create that's also made by hand. And so this was a collaboration between us, Echo Leather, Core Crit, and X Museum in Beijing. It was um, an installation as part of this show that Yepe, uh, Yepe Ogovic, I can't, Yepe and Poppy curated for the X Museum. Um, 
So that's Philip Huang uh, on the subject of brands. I think brands are important. It's figuring out how to how to meet in the middle. And I think that's also like part of my approach. I think sometimes if you have a bad feeling about it, like that when I do, I kind of know when to maybe step away. But for the most part, I think it could be really powerful when you can sort of meet in the middle. And in 2019, I was um, the VP of branding for the Standard Hotels. And in that year, it was really interesting because you know, I think at the time the standard really believed in creating like a space for communities to come together to converge. And I think this idea of convergence is really important when you're your physical space. And I think hospitality really plays an enormous role now that perhaps we're all going to be traveling again and seeing each other, you know, that space in the middle. So this was the last project I did with the standard and it was dead collectors in, in Miami. So we made a bunch of inflatable dead collectors inspired by, dead, with um, Michael Elmgren and Ingo Dragset, um, inspired by the dead collectors they had at their pavilion in Venice many years ago. And there were these inflatables and a bunch of people jumped in the pool. And it's just really about being able to create space, right? So this is something that we did the Standard London during freeze. It was the Standard London's first freeze. You'll notice that Corcrit appears a lot and here's Ivan Pan and somehow we end up doing things together, right? Because if it's about creating like space, bringing people together, I suppose these are the guys that I call. And um, this was puns inspired by this late night dive called Wong's in Bangkok. And what we wanted to create here was like a place where different people you wouldn't expect to see together literally come together under one roof um, what was really, again, also really interesting about the standard was, you know, the opportunity to be able to commission work from like emerging artists. And this was a mural we commissioned um, from Baum to, to, you know, who now I think he had, he's had a couple solo shows in Bangkok City City. I believe his work was shown at Sea Focus. So, you know, this was, again, like a space where artists can come together or you are able to celebrate the work that they do. And this was a dinner we hosted for Crit, for Tosh Basco, Boy Child, and Alex Butch for their participation in the Venice Biennale and the Whitney Biennial in 2019. This is quite fun, actually. So this was the last time we went to Hong Kong for Art Basel. And um, this was when we pre-launched Rick Ritiravanija and Anto Meles um Bastard Cookbook. And this was at Potato Head in Hong Kong. So, you know, I think for many of our viewers looking at this are probably like, well, you know, it's just a bunch of parties, like you organize a bunch of parties. But I think that in a way is like really core, like, is it a party or is it an opportunity to come together to be able to like engage, talk, discuss? And, um, you know, I think this is the first thing that I did with the standard. We, um, so Ivan's Rao Ram from Yangon, we did a pop-up in LA at the standard Hollywood. So, you know, right away for us, maybe right here, it's like, oh, that's cool. It's like a pop up from Yangon. But if you imagine this is Hollywood, it's like strip, right? Hollywood. And it's like a pop up from Yangon, like it's from Myanmar. How does that work? But that was kind of what I really have always, like maybe, you know, it's kind of, how do you, how do you create a mix that no one expects, but yet through the relationships that you have or through the way that you bring people together, they feel comfortable. So this was um, a dinner that we hosted in honor of Kulapat Yandrasat, who was the designer of the first um, freeze in LA with a bunch of his friends. And, you know, so that was like the time that I spent at the standard, which really reinforced this idea of convergence coming together. And um, I think Ghost was another instance of that. So really this is, you know, Crit's project, Crit's dream, Crit and Op, Sutat of uh, Bangkok City City. So they formed the Ghost Foundation and Open Field Foundation. And Ghost happened in 2018. The next edition will also be this year curated by Christina Lee, where I came in with Ghost is that I uh, did a little bit of the fundraising, but again, um, maybe with my team, a very amazing and charming, like amazing people, amazing friends. I think we created the experience and I think worth noting with Ghost is that there's, you know, from Ghost backwards, there are some key people who I think we would never have been able to do this without. And, you know, a huge part of Ghost was like 
friends, but you know, I think Jim Thompson, Jim Thompson, the Jim Tom, Jim Thompson Silk Company, the Thai Silk Company, also the Jim Thompson Art Center was a phenomenal part of this. And I think what I mean by that is how do you find partners where they, how do you find opportunities, right? For, for, for brands or for people or for patrons to participate and for them to be part of something. So with um, Ghost, we created a support print. Um, so that kind of helped towards the fundraising. You know, there were a lot, there was a lot of sponsorship in kind. Some of you would have been like, that was a party that we did at Art Basel. There was the opening dinner, which was an opportunity for other sponsors to come in to be able to help fund the project as a whole. And this was a dinner that we did at Coca with Angela and with Chef Noom. So there's Angela's prawn cocktail sculpture here, but you know, some images from Ghost. Uh, the one on the right is John Wang or Wang Shui's work, which was commissioned by uh, the Jim Thompson Art Center, which was, you know, so I think it's really like, it goes without saying this idea, this, these partners, these relationships that you have and um, a project which I'm really fond of, fond of that I that came before Ghost in a way it was uh, working with Rick Ritiravanija on the Land Foundation. So Rick Rit, some years back said, you know, how do we find a way to to help raise funds for the land? So the land was this project that he founded in 2004, which is literally the land with some houses, but this idea of like going back and and doing things from the land, you know open to anybody everybody's interpretation but you know Rick Ritt has been like a big brother to me in a way in many ways and um again what he does a lot of people will be familiar with like the Pad Thai works some people will be familiar with you know the newspapers with like the words but I think it's really interesting that he's also a filmmaker you know he made this documentary in 2011 of Lung Niu um, Uncle Niu who was a farmer who lived on the land you know, so this idea of like life on the land is something which more and more kind of fascinates me. And um, this was a fundraiser that we did in Hong Kong with Paddle 8. I think many of you would have been there. So we raised a bit of money for the land for their programming. Um, this was a, so just some of the work that I've done. This was a pop-up that we did with Bolan in New York. I think this is important in the context of core crit because this is the first time that I think crit um, hosted an event for his friends. Uh, we basically took over a derelict space like south of Soho and converted it into a restaurant. At the time, there was like no kitchen or anything. So Bo and Dylan arrived in there, but they did it. I mean, it was, um, yeah, a Bolan pop up. And you'll see here that bag with like the check pattern. So, you know, again, Jim Thompson, like a really vital part of like these conversations that I've had, right? Um, and then this was 2014. So we really go back to like the last 10 years. And this was the project that in a way launched everything that I've been doing the last 10 years. And it was this um, film festival or multidisciplinary festival that I co-founded with a friend, Nat Sarasat in 2012 inspired by this idea of projecting films on rocks. And for me, how do we prove that Thailand is more than a place to come and have like a vacation? How can we be the kind of nucleus that brings, you know, that kind of like creates these like explosions of creativity, like projects, how do we bring people together? So, you know, we, um, Peter and Tilda co-curated it in a way that was like, 10 years ago, that's why Memoria in a way is so meaningful because 10 years later, they're back here again in Thailand, you know, celebrating another journey, another dream that they had together. And many people, you know, I think this was a little bit pre-Instagram, so there's not that much about it. So it seems like maybe a myth, but what was important for us back then, and I think for me still now, is how do we bring everyone together and like have them do stuff and do stuff which no one has really, not that they haven't done it before, but that they don't expect to see, you know? How do we like, and I guess someone saying like, no, you can't do that. 
probably makes me go, oh well, yeah, I can. So I have just been really blessed to have the most talented, amazing, resilient people around me who maybe also like live by that. So yeah, Waris did like a boutique workshop, Rickrit and Arto Lindsay did a performance called No Fire, No Ash, because because of mystical reasons, we could not project Andy Warhol's empire, which MoMA had kindly lent to us in the jungle. Um, what you see in the middle was a film made by a 14 year old girl, part of a series we did with the Thai Film Archive where Pishalida basically and Madil basically um, worked with a group of students from the local school to make films. And then, you know, we are very ambitious and very naive. We basically projected things in film and you'll see here like that's Len Lai's Free Radicals and that was on an island. Tom Sachs was there and Tom basically said, well, I want to do something too. So Tom held like a workshop. But I think, you know, I think my part now with like my practice, my approach probably ends with like this picture. Because in a way, when you see this, it um, perhaps overshadows everything else. Because it's like, is that real? Is that photoshopped? I mean, maybe it's a little photoshop to make it look clearer. But this is pre-drone and a picture of the Archipelago Cinema, which Ole Sheeran designed for Film on the Rocks. And it was on the third night of our, of our programming. And um, everyone came on boats. They came to this raft and they watched uh, a short that Pizza made with Christelle Lora called uh, Songs from the Bottom of the Ocean, which was like uh, clips of sounds from the Titanic. Um, and Peter, uh, Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan with, uh, with live uh, vocals by Simon Fischer-Turner and one of our amazing producers, uh, gun of very kind invention. So when everyone arrived, I think no one really knew what this looked like because it was dark, but that was like the archipelago cinema. And I just wanted to show this because this is what it was, um, being able to work with the tide uh, it wasn't huge, apart from the screen, which was designed by our friend Poon, who at the time was like 19 years old, maybe 20, genius. He's also who does like the lighting and sound for everything I've done ever, like since. But you see like the wooden stuff, it was done by fishermen, like shrimp fishermen, you know, because this was based, Ole had based the design on like, um, like fishing pontoons. So that's kind of film on the rocks. And I guess... I just wanted to kind of end this section with like, I don't know how it got to film on the rocks and mysterious ordinary. And I think for me, I just sort of like rolled with it. And a lot of it is like innately like connections, literally like a connection you have with someone. And for me, it really started, I think with um, like a lot of the writing work that I did. So this was actually not many know, people know about this, but this was a, uh, a dinner that we organized to celebrate Pizza's um, Uncle Bunmi in New York during the New York Film Festival after he won the Palme d'Or. So you see Tilda was even a co-host, but I'm not sure, you know. So it was, it's this sort of like chain of connections and like conversations that we've always had. And it's always been through like writing, right? So Two Magazine has always been a really important part of like what I do. Um, Lynn was the editor in chief. And I think also like, I think as a lawyer, trained as a lawyer, you kind of make an argument, you write. So when I was at MCOT, I was also writing. And before that I had a blog as everyone, you know, in, your, in their twenties in like the 2000s did. So I had a blog and I used to love going to art events. And I never, I had kind of just wrote on this blog and I had, was very grateful to meet Patsy Bunak, um, Eric Booth's late mom, who inspired me to write properly and um, introduced me to Nawin Rowan Chaikun, the artist, and said, you know, why don't you write for newspapers or something like write? So I did. So, you know, I started submitting work to like Pikong Riti at the time at the Bangkok Post. It was Tatla. This was an article I did on Abhishat Pong for Purple. And that's kind of like, I guess, how you take it. Um, a background like in law and somehow parlay it to everything that I've done. So I guess that's that's it. Thanks, Chongwan. I, I, I love that you end with that's it when in fact this has been so amazing and so many things uh, that, that you've shared. And I, I know we've 
spoken about a few of these things before, but it's really nice to hear you connect the dots. Um, so I'll, I'll invite questions once again, as people are listening to us kind of speak for the next while. And if any questions come in, we can also kind of relay them, but maybe I can kick off with some thoughts and, and a question from one, which is, you know, as, as I was listening to you go through these activities, um, in some ways, it's it's paying attention to all these activities that happen in and around the exhibition, right? It's 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 also it's not just the screening, it's not just the show, but it's the gala, it's the opening, it's what happens before, what happens after. How do you sustain interest, right? And I, I, there's I think there's many people who've written about all of these activities as para-curatorial activities or things that kind of happen in and around the curatorial. But what's interesting to me is that a lot of, you know, writings that come from Europe and America on this will talk about these activities as kind of a product of the financialization of contemporary art or kind of how contemporary art has really grown. And now this is kind of lifestyle, like uh, altitude to it, then all these activities kind of form part of that. But I see, I see what you're doing almost in, in, in another side of the spectrum, which is that there's no, there's no giant to critique because the ecosystem in Thailand is qu quite small, right? So it's, it's actually more so not necessarily a project of, of, uh, of you know, trying to change or operate something, but, but to really build and to really form. And it's a very positive project, right? Of kind of trying to grow something and bring people together and to grow the ecosystem, right? So maybe because you've worked in the ecosystem and been growing it for a while, can you maybe share a little bit how you see how things have changed? You know, like if how it was in the beginning, do you see kind of it growing or, or what, what are just kind of your observations as you've worked over time? I think, um... Thank you for the observations. I actually, it's a, again, when you're in it quite deep and I've realized recently that I've kind of dived in quite deep, you don't really see it for what it is. Um, I think it's really positive. I think what we've seen with, you know, Memoria itself, this uh, sort of exhibition that took place in a mall recently, um, what you see is there's a lot of people who are interested or could be interested and this is really different from, you know, when I first started like writing on my blog about art where it really was like a small group of people and the writing that you got, I think you got a lot more in Thai, but it was a lot less in English. I think it wasn't as open because it was a smaller group of people. And with time, you know, in a way, this isn't necessarily our system, like, you know, contemporary art, modern art, contemporary art. This is something that in a way is relatively new to us. We don't have institutions in a way that one does in Europe or in America or even in Singapore, Hong Kong, um, Seoul, doesn't exist here. And what I've seen is, you know, there's more, there's more collectors, there's more galleries, there's more artists, there's more conversations. What still doesn't exist is there's no kind of like media that really, you know, it's like you get the super critical stuff that sometimes is a little bit hard to read or you get stuff that just like glosses things over, but how do you create in that middle, you know, I think it's not really for us in the ecosystem already to judge who should come in and who doesn't. I think it's about opening the doors and letting people decide for themselves. So I think there's a lot more opening of doors because there's more people and that part is awesome but I think there's still a lot of work to do. And I think the reason why, you know, the question always is like, why are there not more patrons? Why are there not more collectors? Why is there no kind of, why is there, there are no spring gala or fall gala? Why aren't companies donating more to culture? And, you know, we got to go back to like the upper level where there are no tax breaks right? Like it doesn't matter whether you throw a gala in April or in November because no one's going to give you a tax break. So you're better off donating to a temple and it's going to give you that tax break. So there's things that are happening at that level that maybe we're not looking at that, you know, at the working level, it's just frustrating. 
but you know, why is there no art fair? Well, it's because the luxury tax, which is imposed on contemporary art, because that's viewed as like a watch would be viewed. So you really have to look at, I think, the intentions. I mean, for me, what I'm really grateful for is like, we could be pretty bitter about it and just be like, ah, oh. but there's so many people. Like yesterday, I had a conversation with a young female filmmaker so brilliant she actually sat next to me in one of the master classes she asked this brilliant question I was like oh my gosh there's a whole room of people like young people who want to do things and do not feel confined by the inefficient um how do you say the inefficient management of resources in our country you know like there's a fight so that's cool yeah yeah, and I feel like it must be gratifying to kind of see this you know, new and new, more and more people come in, right, over time. Yeah. And I, what you were saying just now, it, it, there, there were a few words that came up that kept recurring also that, you know, you were kind of saying that so oftentimes you, you, you act as kind of the, you're thinking about the medium, right, you're being the media for artists, you're serving as a translator, of course, as a lawyer, you represent in, in, in a certain sense, right? And I, I wonder in, in all of these ways, you know, you're, you're in some ways helping different artists and different producers kind of craft their voice and, and get their thoughts and ideas and, and work out there, right? But that work of translation and putting it out there is very different, say, for, you know, someone like Rip, Piriel Grit, who is very kind of, has a high degree of cultural fluency and is, is able to kind of traverse these worlds himself as well, versus say when you work with um, with your brand and with kind of the producers and, and people in Sekonda Khan who are making the indigo dye. And you've, I think, spoken very much about kind of using IP in that almost activist way of how, how do you really use IP for the people for, for whom oftentimes it is not kind of actually serving good. So I'm just kind of wondering how, how do you kind of negotiate such different registers of, you know, having to work with, I think every one of these people who you work with are creative producers, but the, there are different responsibilities and I think ethical obligations that you have to, to, to each of them. Yeah. This is such a good question. Um, I'm going to, many ways to answer, but I think it's what I view in, a, in many ways what my role is. You know, IP can be viewed in many ways, but, you know, with um, one of my PhD supervisors, also, you know, friend David Llewellyn, who actually is in Singapore, and also my father, who is an IP kind of expert, we believe, I mean, what I've been taught is IP was, is, is a fluid instrument. It's a human construct but ultimately what it protects, what it represents is our expression. You know, it's very human. You know, sometimes it's used for like commercial means, but what would it be like if it is really used for people? You know, and at one level you can see it as like a sort of complex thing. Like what we do as lawyers, it's very complex. But the reason I think I take such great pleasure working with an artist like Piruk Rit or Pita or even Korkrit or the artisans that we work with in Sakona Khan is that it's, it's very simple, you know, it's very simple because what they want to express is it really comes like uniquely from them. And, you know, many years ago, I remember coming across a question, you know, someone asked me like, why do you guys just have to talk about Thailand? Like, you know, having spent most of your life abroad, why Thailand? And you know, this question has like plagued my mind for many years, for like two decades. You know, the question is, it's because, you know, this is land, this is ours. And maybe sometimes it's not ours, but it's something which it's it's like it's something to be celebrated and it's something to to negotiate with, you know, to have a conversation with. And I think that negotiation, that conversation is the same, whether it's with Pirak Rit or, you know working with like Kun, Kunyai Masa'at, you know, in the film, if you watch, she's uh, in Finding Oasis, she's the first grandma. She knows very well where she stands, you know? And I think it's this like ability to adapt. I think that's something that's like quite Thai because we just sort of, you know, keep adapting to things. I think that that's, 
you know, to go back to the question, I think it's like, for me, I think it's also knowing that my work only very recently since this talk, I realized that this is my approach, but that my work is about celebrating them. So finding the right partners, finding the right angle, finding the right communications, being able to say no to people who you know innately in your heart, even though what they're promising you is the world is not good. You know, it's because ultimately you are making something which doesn't exist. You know, and I think that's just like being honest somehow. Yeah. So yeah. I think it can be honest. Law can be something like honest and good if we let it be, because it's about our true expressions. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a beautiful way to to think of it and you know to to hear of your commitment in that sense, you know, because I feel like um when sometimes when we think of IP, you know, I think it's more about how corporations can monetize IP, right? Or, or, or in terms of um, that that level of, of understanding, right? So it's really refreshing to hear this from you. And I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I think time is running short, but I want to make sure I ask you this last question before uh, we go to the Q&A from the audience, which is, I know we've spoken many times about, you know, your perhaps in thinking about what, what does a curator do or what in, in now in your role as part of the curatorial team at DAB, you know, and I, I, I know maybe you can't share too many details as of yet, but perhaps if you could speak a little bit more about kind of how you're bringing all these experiences to, to bear on your role now and kind of, as you mentioned earlier, you know, you're now thinking about this as almost a, an approach that you have developed consciously or subconsciously over time, right? So maybe if you could flesh that out a little bit more. So again, I think this is the first official title I've had in the art world. There's many worlds, but the art world. And I think it was like cumbersome for me at the beginning because I really wasn't sure what I was supposed to do. And I've had multiple conversations with Corcrit about this because through him, I have met many amazing curators and I know so many amazing curators and it really made me quite nervous but then I realized like maybe I'm there because I don't come from the art world you know I've just sort of dabbled and moonlighted and I think what it means is like what I bring to the table then is in a way how do you say consistent to what I've always wanted to do or what I've always been doing is if this is the line I want to propose another voice, another story, an alternative to what this is. And I think the theme is very fitting. I mean, when you see my list or the list generally, maybe I should be working with more emerging artists. Um, maybe I should be working with more kind of like things that are, are from over there. But I think that would also be not honest to where I stand in my role because what I want to do is to create a place of convergence and highlight the area in the middle. And if in Thailand, what you're dealing with is a big chunk of mainstream and everything which is independent is way over there, I am interested in creating, the bridges exist, huh? Because artists like Rick Ritt, Abhishad Pong, you know, the, the bridge exists, but how do you fill the space so that people can kind of like come in and not be forced to have to take the narrative you've given them as like the Bible. You know, how do you invite them to come in and have their own point of view? How do you engage them? You know, they can, they very happy if you don't like it, but it'd be cool to have a conversation. So I think this, so the artists that I'll be working with, I think really offer this um, alternative, alternative, whether it be in the mediums that they use or the narratives that they're presenting, whether it be about history or the future. And that's where, you know, technology is also like the conversation right now too, which we obviously don't have time to talk about, but I think this is where it becomes really interesting in the realm of like fundraising itself. And I am very delusionally optimistic about all of this. <laughs> Like it's the only way you can go about producing a biennial. <laughs> so I think that's, I'm really excited to see what you and, and the team come up with. And I know we're running short on time. So maybe I'll, I'll go to the Q&A and 
if there are any other questions uh, from the audience, please do submit them. So the, the question, one question we've received is, uh, hi, thanks for the amazingly eye-opening sharing. Love the colorful tapestry. I am curious as to the journey that you embarked on as you, as you pivoted from law to the arts. So mm, that's a that's quite a big question, but maybe I I, I feel you've touched on this uh, in bits and pieces. But I I think the subtext for this question as well I think is perhaps in thinking about how how do you make the jump from one career or field to another, or or maybe the fluidity of it. Right? Yeah. So yeah. thank you for the question. It's really good. I think about it all the time. Um, I really wanted to go to art school. I couldn't go to art school, I went to law school. Um, what is really in a way kind of awesome is I don't think of myself as working in the art world, nor do I think of myself as a lawyer. I think a lot of times the skills of multiple years of law school and the discipline that you're, you need to have in a way has like informed my approach and probably enabled me to work with artists for so long particularly the ones who really have like huge visions, like corporate, for example. Um, I think the jump is just, I don't know whether I ever realize I'm making any jumps. It's just doing it because it feels kind of right. And knowing also that in a room, if you're in a room full of artists and you're the one who really doesn't mind reading a contract, then that's kind of cool. Maybe it's like, I'm kind of helpful. So I think that that informs that very much. Thanks, thanks, Chongwan. Um, maybe a last question in this instance is uh, just, I know you're working on the Bangkok Biennial now, but maybe are there other projects on the horizon that you know, you're also invested in or other things that are ongoing in your life as well alongside Bangkok Biennial that you know, for those of us who would like to follow along in the things that you're doing. Okay. So this is an opportunity. Okay, so obviously there's Philip Wong, um, which is ongoing because it's the family business. Uh, we are resurrecting Two Magazine, which has always been a project which is very dear to me, but we really felt that there needed, there needs to be a platform here in Thailand when there is gonna be Ghost and BAB happening and hopefully a month off to that Wonder Fruit we really feel like we need to resurrect ourselves from the grave. You know, we went to sleep in 2018 to be able to share, you know, to be able to bring people together because contrary to what a lot of people might think, you know, we are all working together in a very small ecosystem and we all talk to each other. And there's very little room for that because it's too small. And I think that is where it's so beautiful. Um, so there's two, there's Philip Huang, there is a project, there's always a project with the artists that I work with. I don't know what they are yet, but PJ will always say that it's brewing. Um, yeah, so I guess for now, I mean, BAB is, is big. I, I just, but going back to Philip Huang a second, you know, it's a, it's a vehicle, so we we will we, we work with artists we work we will be working with technology um if you look at the color blue you look at things like plant knowledge ancient knowledge there is a lot of room to be able to bring that to life and keep it going and um it's funny because many years ago when i started mysterious ordinary i never i didn't really know what it was either it was just i needed to put something under one umbrella and I think that there's just always going to be projects. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, you just have to follow it. Right. I don't know. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Maybe one last question because this one just came in and then we um, can wrap up. Um, this audience member says, wonderful talk from one. I think the need to open up the conversations about art, culture, cinema is an urgent one. How has the experience been of having to convince artists and filmmakers to do more public facing events? Um, I have been very blessed to work with artists who understand their role as professionals. 
um, I think that is something which is very unique. I think that as with other professions, like whether you're a lawyer or whether you're um, a doctor, you have to turn up, you know, and understanding that, you know, as an artist, it doesn't give you, in a way it gives you, especially as an artist with um, an audience, it gives you perhaps a responsibility. And I think, I do hope I get to work with more, with younger artists, more emerging artists. I fear that sometimes I can be a bit overpowering and that's why I don't, but maybe like now that I'm older, I can soften up. But I think it's, it's understanding that, you know, if you don't try, how do you know, right? It's like that, no doubt is it, like there's no fail, just try. And I, I, and I think it is in line with like, I guess my entire approach, like even if someone says no, they don't wanna support you, at least they know you exist. And I think it's the same with like artists, filmmakers who innately have their own worlds. But I think it's really like something quite beautiful when you can share that world. And in a way, it's also like a profession, you know? Thanks, Chongwen. I keep saying last question, but the questions keep coming in. So, I mean, um, well, truly, truly last one. Thank you so much for sharing how you serve as an access point and as a bridge, bringing together so many seemingly disparate worlds. How do you continue to hold safe spaces that offer freedom and expansion? Uh, 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 to for people to express themselves unencumbered? Um, that's a really good question. I hope I can do it forever. But you know, what it is, is uh, really, really, I think some of it's got to be luck. But a lot of it has been really identifying the right partners. I think none of this would be possible, like, on my own, on our own. I think it's creating a community, you know, if today, I think it's also about like longevity, right? If you only work with one community today, suppose someone retires, then what? I think it's about constantly identifying, building, supporting, finding the right partners. Cause you know, resources, I mean, I'm also, I, I could be more practical and more realistic, but it's also about everything that we do requires funding. It requires resources. Where does that come from? Obviously at some point it comes from commerce, especially in our imperfect ecosystem. So I think it's um, identifying the right partners, knowing that even though they don't exist today, maybe they will exist like in two years and 10 years and being able to cultivate a community and like cultivating the community is obviously easier if everyone feels like comfortable, relaxed, well-fed, you know, and it, so I think it's that care. That's yeah. A great place to leave off for us for tonight. But thank you so much, Chongwan, for generously sharing and, and kind of digging back through the archive and bringing us this narrative and, and telling us, sharing us your experiences. And thank you everyone for uh, tuning in today. Um, Thank you again, Chung Wan, and hopefully we'll get to see each other in person soon. Uh, in the meantime, I'll hand it over back to Janice to, to close this off for tonight. Thank you so much to Chung Wan for today's talk. And thank you, Kenji, for moderating the session. Artworks, a conversation with Chung Wan Wiraruari, is held in conjunction with Koa Kri Aruna Nonsai, a machine boosting energy into the universe in which the artist explores the togetherness of human, machine, and spirit in 21st century Bangkok. Do catch the exhibition by 3rd May at Tanjong Paga District Park. We hope to see everyone there.